Um, so I'm now going to turn this over to Zach Rogo, who is going to introduce um, Cornelius Edy. Thanks, Bob. I actually uh, first met Cornelius Edy back in the late 1970s when we were baby poets together on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, um, hanging out at St. Mark's Poetry Project, which is kind of the um, institutional wing of the New York School of Poetry. And for many of the writers that we knew at that time, it was really about the lifestyle, which was fun. We slurped borscht in late night Ukrainian delis in the East Village. Uh, it was important to be seen in the right clothes at the right cafe at the right time. <laughs> to throw yourself at the feet of the legendary speed freak poets of the New York School. <laughs> and um, it, it was a fascinating time, but I think that for Cornelius, it wasn't about the lifestyle, it was always about the poetry. And of all the poets who I knew at that time, and there were many aspiring poets um, at the time in the neighborhood, I think that Cornelius has made the most meaningful career as a writer for himself. Cornelius Eady has created a podium somewhere between Langston Hughes and the wind. In his recent poems, he creates and develops points of view that most of us wouldn't even imagine, but they're points of view that allow, allow us to see deeply into the American mind. He often has speakers of his poems who never existed or no longer exist, as in the dazzling Running Man sequence from his most recent book, Brutal Imagination. This is one of two poem cycles that Cornelius Eady has written that have been adapted into musical dramas and have been highly acclaimed. In his seven books, he's found a way to hit hard about many issues, but never in a way that's predictable. He knows how to invite indignation and absurdity into the same room and to get them to talk to each other. His many honors include the prestigious Lamont Prize, of the Academy of American Poets. Please give a warm welcome to Cornelius Eady. Thank you. Thank you. It's a. Uh, it's really. Uh, it's really a uh, real pleasure to be here this afternoon to read for everybody back on the Berkeley campus. Um, my connection with Berkeley, of course, goes back to, to June, June Jordan, uh, who was a dear friend of mine and um, uh, very, very, very missed, especially um, in these times that we're in right now. I really, you know, I really feel that we miss, miss that, that voice, that, that presence, that clarity, you know, that could really uh, be useful you know, at this, that, you know, right now. Uh, with all the bombs and the, and the damage that's being done, not only to the human lives, but also to the, the idea of democracy in this country and also to the idea of language, which is being totally you know, destroyed. Bob's giving a great, great example of that, you know, freedom. <laughs> you know? Um, I, my favorite word right now is embedded, right? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean the sense of the, sense of the word, way that irony is sort of like disappeared. I, I, I can't believe that the, that the, that the U.S., News media c didn't didn't get the joke, right? <laughs> right? I um, mean, you watch somebody on CNN and basically you're saying, you know, so and so in bed with, <laughs> you, know, you know, right? Right? The, the, you know, the army or the marines or something, and, and without a trace of irony, they say, they say that right into the microphone and right into the camera. It's like, you know, but um, you know, it's it's really it's really scary and, and, and horrific time that we're that we're passing through right now, and we and, and part of the, of the uh, of, of the uh, anxiety that we're all feeling, of course, is that we don't know what's going to happen, you know? We know what's going to happen next, uh, what shape it's going to take. Uh, but the thing about writing, the thing, thing about language, I think, about poetry, at least, in times like these, is that um, my personal belief about poetry is that it's the absolute enemy of silence, you know? Um, and so I really do believe that um, one, of the, one of the great things about what's, in terms of the response that at least the poets have started to, to do um, it says it's a way of kind of reclaiming language and reclaiming um, some sort of sense of uh, clarity or thinking about what we're doing uh, or, what, or maybe to be more particular and precise about it, what other people are doing on our behalf or in our names. 
Anyway, I'm going to start not with anything political, but with something personal. Um, it's from a memoir that I've been working on. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to deal with the microphones and reading at the same time, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm working on a memoir between all these different other things that I've been doing, about the, 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 uh, you know, the, the plays, the uh, other books that I've been working on, and um, it's, it's a um, memoir that's, sort of, that's still at the, at the moment untitled. Um, I've been working again, working on and off on it uh, for about five years. Um, it sort of take, takes place between the time years of um, about five or six years old and it'll probably end when I'm about 17. Um, this is when I started to get serious about writing poetry or when I started to be, discover poetry in any way, shape, or uh, any, take it seriously, I should say. But the first place, first thing I'm going to read is actually the first encounter I had with poetry in any way, shape, or form. I'm from upstate New York and um, um, the, the town I'm from is, um, is Rochester, so a lot of, the, most of this takes place here, there. First thing is called poetry. It's Valentine's Day. Fourth grade, Nathaniel Rochester, school number three. Today, we learn about poetry. Mrs. Edwards, our teacher, who is my age now, but very old then, has reached a unit in her teaching guide concerning rhyme and meter. But I already know what I need to know. Like a good kid, my body automatically squirms at the word. Why? Have I ever read a poem before this? No. Neither has any other child in the class, but the word just has that sound about it. Like vegetables. <laughs> that makes us want to shove our hands in our pockets and pout. It's a grown-up word, a suck-the-fun-from-out-of-the-room word. Like behave. Every kid winces as if the lips of a dreaded ant were upon them. Today, class, Mrs. Edwards says in that hopeful tone I've grown to use myself over the years, you will choose a valentine and write them a poem. But no one loves anybody this morning. <laughs> the word poetry has clammed our affection up. Mrs. Edwards, however, has this going for her. She comes prepared. She is the third teacher we've had so far this year. Our first grew ill or pregnant, our second young, idealistic, maybe fresh from college, only lasted a few days. We could smell her fear. She wanted to be our friend, which is the weakest thing a teacher could ever do. One afternoon, in the middle of a lesson she knows we're not listening to, her voice begins to crack. Then she begins to sob. Her weeping eyes look out on a class that holds absolutely no pity. Twenty odd smug faces asking, what are you doing here? <laughs> she slams her book on her desk and runs. Pleasure buzzes among ourselves. In the war between grown-ups and kids, this day is a lot of Custer scalp. <laughs> Mrs. Edwards understands that the only things a fourth grade class will understand is respect earned through a little unspecified fear. Some people have a voice that tells a kid, don't try it. Mrs. Edwards lets us hear this voice on her first date with us. This is why for this new exercise, we will moan quietly in our heads and take out a sheet of paper. Poetry. Mrs. Edwards, not wanting to waste all morning on this, has taken pity on us by writing out a group of words on the blackboard that end in the letter S. Use the words on the board, she says, to write your poem. Give the poem to your valentine, or if you're too shy, to Mrs. Edwards, who will pin them unsigned on the bulletin board. Poetry. Our dumb pencils skate the paper. We shift in our seats, we sniffle, bored. Why do they ask this stuff of us? What do they want to know? How nosy can you get? Out of the forest near silence, the low rumble of business in the other classrooms, the sound of fingers brushing away erased words, the awful tick of the wall clock, come four lines into my head. S-O-S, -S, I'm in a mess. <laughs> And I need you, I must confess. <laughs> is that it? Is this what she wants? I'd rather be in gym class, bunched up in a corner with the rest of the skinny boys, fighting for our lives against the jocks in a game of dodgeball. Good, says Mrs. Edwards. When she reads it, where does it go? Into some young girl's hand who couldn't care less, and I don't remember, and somehow, somewhere, deep in my wannabe a soldier, fireman, doctor, Head. Thank you.
Thank you. The woman. Daddy and I are in his Buick, stopped at a red light when a young, shapely woman crosses our path. I'm 11 or 12 years old, maybe older, and I'm beginning to form secret opinions. These are the days when we don't really get along, but I keep my mouth shut as he tries to tell me things. I don't like him, but I want something. If I am in the car, it must be to protect my sister's and my shopping interests, except for a few personal items, which he leaves to my mother. My father is the one who does all the grocery shopping at our house. He is the only dad we've ever heard of that does this. It is his way of controlling the purse strings. Plus, I think it is, a, it is an excuse for him to get out of the house on weekends. Too bad for us, he tends to think of groceries as fuel. These are the days we're living partly off government surplus, parted milk and parted shame. Though we're kids, our tongues and stomachs must know what any foot soldier knows. We crave sweets, seasoning, and the occasional brand name, but we are living with a man who sleeps on the couch and thinks Ritz crackers are cookies. <laughs> we have learned that it's far better just to be in the store and grab than trying to explain. We are in the car together. I'm surrounded by the smell of grease on rags and the metal toolbox he keeps in the back seat. And though I love the Buick, I don't like him. I am the drunk at the rescue mission. He is the sermon you have to endure before you get to chow down. I am suffering in silence as he rattles on. These are my impatient days with him. The stuff I'm interested in. Atomic submarines. Flying squirrels. The way a finger skims the surface of a horse chestnut, he cares nothing about. The woman crosses our path, mm, says my daddy. His eyes are radar on our hips. Look at that heifer. Then the light changes, and off we sail with my father's unheard blessing sniffing at the heels of the woman's big legs. There is a sensation of stillness in the cab as the rest of the world glides by. I smell the pennies stuck to the bottom of the open glove compartment. For the moment, he thinks we're pals. We're not pals. I'm restless. He thinks we're friends. We're not friends. The Arrows. My sister, her best friend Linda, and I are out in the neighborhood at night stalking cars. We wield homemade bows, tall green stems we call ragweed, cut and curved with string found lying around our homes. For arrows, we have weighed and selected the right dry branches and notched one end for the twine. For arrowheads, we use pop bottle caps, wielded on by, by rocks or the weight of our sneakers. We are at war, and in the easy, confused, jumbled kids make of history, we are out to destroy Nazi, we set out to destroy Nazi tanks with bows and arrows. Tonight, we fight both the Germans and the cowboys. We are doing this stuff, this kids, we, I'm sorry, we are doing this stuff kids love to do without thinking, without asking. If caught, they'll call it play. Whose idea was this? Probably my sister's. At least she's at the age when my parents begin to falter curiosity and willpower. What are we doing out at night? Since everyone in the neighborhood knows everyone else, and we rarely travel any further than the four or five blocks, the shops on West Main Street at the, the edge of a bit too far at one end, the railroad bridge at Carissa Street at the other, our parents let us roam the summer streets until we run out of fuel. I am seven or eight years old, Linda and my sister entering their teens. In a few years, I will be a guy and too old to be a mascot, but for now, we are a team. We are at war, we are Indians, we are tank killers, we are tramped behind enemy lines. We are also scientists. We are curious to know the physics involved when an arrow hits a speeding car. We scrunch our small bodies into the damp along the trusses of the bridge and wait. We hear the first car before we see it. We hide, we hide, and then we spring. I will not grow up to be a hunter, but I do know how the blood pounds in the ear the second before you draw in your breath and take a bead. We are too scared to miss. The light-colored sedan rocks and reels. For a long moment after the sound of the skid fades, there is nothing but the car, the bridge, the summer star is winking. Then the door opens, and part of a human arm begins to swing out. Very two more. The fight. My mother and daddy fight in our bedroom, which is, wait, I'm sorry, my mother and daddy fight in our bedroom, in what actually should be the dining room of our house. I am five or six years old, and I do not know why this is happening. A few moments before this starts, 
it feels like a normal day. It feels like summer. The door to the kitchen, the vestibule and front porch are open, breeze and daylight pours through the house. Perhaps my sister and I dream of important things, like for instance, the nickel it costs to buy a great popsicle. Then my folks bang into and about the room. They're so angry. Over what? What has my mother heard? She swings and swings at my daddy's head with her fists, and finally they begin to swipe too close. What name has my daddy called her? He grabs her wrist and locks them in mid-fall. How horrible the way her arms shake, her will to smash him. For a few long seconds, there they tremble, pushing against one another. Her fists are bombs. Our poor room. My sister and I don't know what to do. How did things come to this? Our parents are a local hurricane. They are rival bear gods, pushing and uprooting trees, streams, tables, dressers, with no thought of the consequence. Where do we turn? Which way to run? Their arms clatter the chandelier above our heads. The tulip of glass above the bulb, around the bulb wobbles, sings, and chips. They romp and stomp, and we feel their tremors through the wooden floor. This is the only time I can recall their barbs and put-downs coming to blows. What's happened? Gravity tugs and their muscles flex. She isn't strong enough to reach him, but he dare not let her go. Sanctified. Here's the deal, according to my mother. My sister and I must go to church until we reach our teens, which is when we'll be old enough to make up our own minds. I'm six or seven years old, my sister 10 or 11. I think my mother's reasoning has something loosely to do with bar mitzvahs, but it is one of those things <laughs> we can't negotiate. My younger brother Roosevelt, who squeals but cannot speak and is a handful, goes only when she thinks he can use a laying on of hands. My daddy doesn't go. He hates church so much we make up jokes about it. Tongues of lightning flickering down and catching the seat of his heathen pants as he strolls by the church. We laugh at him, but we envy the free pass my mother gives him every Sunday. The Sunday school she forces us to go to most of the time, the Gospel Tabernacle, is a missionary church run by plainly dressed, earnest white people. We're too young to know we are their mission. What we do know is that we hate the dressing up, the girly dresses and the monkey suits, the polite but brittle way they make us sit up straight in our seats, the way they expect us to memorize the Bible stories that somehow we'd be wise not to disappoint them, for they are God's deputies. So when our mother decides to take us to her black church one Sunday, we jump at the chance, at least for a while, as we readjust to the rougher surroundings. Her church is in a storefront, loud silk curtains across a plate glass window. Though the lights, bare bulbs are on, it takes a second for our eyes to focus. Here, they call my mother sister. Both churches have an organ, but while the white church whispers, the black church growls. It pulls well-dressed women up into a sweat and men in mohair to lose their jackets and silk ties. In a few fast measures, everyone's on their feet, screaming, moaning, arms, flinging up as if they could grab hold of the robe and personally haul the Savior into the first row of folding chairs. For a few minutes, it's amusing to watch as my sister and I vote with our eyes, which plump butt makes the best jar of fool's jelly, but things refuse to settle down. In fact, the church rocks with a noise we've never heard before. Why are they acting like this? Something in their dancing makes us worry. If this is something we should be seeing, if someone is going to break in and catch us, this Jesus they scream for isn't the one our mother has been sending us away to visit. <laughs> now I'm going to read some new poems, or newer poems. Um, in the fall, last October, my wife and I bought a, um, a house, uh, a summer house in upstate New York in a little town called Acre, which is outside of a smallest town called Cairo. It's, it's spelled like Cairo, but how, this is how you tell a, um, a native from a um, vacation person, because if you won't go into to, to Cairo and you say, uh, how far is it to, to Cairo? They know right away, right? That's a little, it's a little slip, you know. It, it's, 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 you know, you're, you're an out of towner. <laughs> so, so, so we bought this this house, not knowing that um, buying this thing uh, was going to open up all these all, all sorts of other things we had to learn about 
ourselves and about house homeowning and all this other stuff. But um, I've written these poems over the winter, um, and uh, it was also the end of a long period um, where basically I was pretty much dry, even though I was working um, in theater. Um, it was still I was still in shock over September 11th, and on top of that, a lot of, of, of dear friends of mine. Um, the final, almost at the end of this list, is, is June, uh, uh, died around us. So, so the poems are dealing with that, and also with the idea of waiting, 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 waiting for the bombs to drop. Hard-headed weather. These leaves which have yellow then are aloft, or waving like bright hands at their stem as I drive my small red car under this raw and whipped November sky and the wag of the bare branch, the argument between the wind and what the wind desires to push, the sleet, a hard-headed weather, this landscape nudging towards sleep. A year has passed since you died, and you died, and you, and this world absent of you all fidgets, ungentle, on the eve of misadventure. I steer towards my house upstate. Friends, who ever thought that I own doors you won't open, floors never to carry your tread? Now an orphan in me awakens sore and sad. On my CD player, a traditional folk song rumbles the glass and I think of Whitman, nursing his wounds and boys at the military hospital, his poetic notion of death now a kid's thready breath he can't repair, or a young hand he grips with all the possibility and it lays cold. Here is my middle-aged throat, singing along as I drive, singing to you. Pre-war, this is for a friend of mine, Henrik DeLeo, who was the um, uh, husband of um, uh, another poet uh, friend of mine, also mentor, Sri Loray. Uh, he had the uh, unfortunate coincidence of dying of cancer on September 11th. Pre-war. You left as the war began. In the November wind off the mountain, an American flag left behind by the previous owners of our house flits above the lawn, brave laundry, among bare branches. Paul loses its grip. I am arrested by the way the mid-morning breeze and sun watches the needles of the pine trees, the first dust of snow. Wait, speaks to dead seeds and leaves on the grass. Wait, hushes the smoke from the chimney. Actions have been flung into motion, and soon I will see, with everyone left, the dying you missed by dying. First winter. Now it is December. Rain has crawled over the mountain, and our pine trees have paid for it, Branches bent and broken off, this one and that one, taken while we slept down state. This is what winter can do, what can wait for your stun arrival. We walk the lawn we thought we owed, dotted with small casualties, telling the rough way the snow, the rain, and heavy ice knows of business. And here is the roof, vandalized by thaw and freezes, and the stiffened grass roughed off and tangled into the driveway by the snowplow. We're new at this, weekenders, city folks, somewhat absorbed by gentle calamity. Off we wander into what happens, the merciless scrub of wind testing our coats. Two more from here. Digging out. It is merely, it is nearly January. All day I hear the wind sing its rough music, push the rhododendron, peeking from drifts like strands on an old man's scalp. After two days of blizzard, the land almost feels ready to make amends, to remember the dot of houses, the vanity of pavement, or perhaps sleep it off. Here is the shovel, there is the salt, your wrist, your shoulders, scraping out what piles against your knees. Under this, the foxglove, the steps, the door to the basement, the roof with its smart new frosty cap. And recycling. At the dump, the old head took one look at us, the middle-aged black and white couple, pulling up in their running down 10 plus year old Saturn, dutifully lugging the first few weeks of meals and mistakes at our new house and new. It's mid-December, bare branches crisscross the horizon, the air begins to build up its first charge of serious snow. We are learning the ways we're expected to deal with accumulation. 15 miles from our front door, we haul the coffee, dro coffee grounds and spent drafts. He works in a world where all the prettiness has long been scrubbed away and all that's left is what we did. To leave our mess behind, he must punch the ticket we bought from the county. We must sort our life into those rusting bins. Anybody with eyes can tell we're a story that couldn't have originated there. He noticed, like him, we're, um, we're members of that weird tribe of odds and ends, tumble seeds that dig in where least expected. 
Finally, he can loosen up. It comes another fucking war, he tells us, relieved to have found us. It piles up in his world like it piles up in ours. This is for um, a uh, black journalist um, named um, Joe Wood. And uh, he, he disappeared. He, he was, he was um, a really good journalist, wrote a lot for the, for the Village Voice in New York and did, did some other things too. And, and, he went, and he disappeared in 1999. He was, on a, uh, he was at a conference um, in Washington State and he, in, in, in the middle of, of the conference, he decided to go bird watching on Martin Rainier and he disappeared. Just disappeared and his body's never been found. The ghosts, the mountain. Where is he? Now that the woods are quiet and the snow, April thawed, has carved a bit more from the rocks. Now that the new grass has spiked on the foot, where is the young black man in his freshly bought jacket and his union shoes, in his urban shoes, the city kid who loves birds, poetically speaking in heaven, surrounded with what, how the world works deep in the noise of transformation, his still body swimming the way a rock moves through time. Mount Rainier collects his old memories. Here's a list. Joe Wood is buried here and so is the story about Malcolm X. Joe Wood is buried here and so is the notion concerning, concerning hip hop. Joe Wood is buried here, first black man dead on the mountain. Joe Wood is buried here with maybe the song of the bird he followed singing above his head. Whose world is this? A bridge of snow softens and your black body falls to the swift, swift water. A rock cops an attitude and grabs your heel over the ridge you fly. Your mother worries your black skin and soft frame drew the loonies to your side like nectar. The living can't know what your body told you then, how the roots or current tucked you in, how you hurt and slept and what came after. A ranger says, this ain't Central Park. They don't know what to do with you. They'd like you to be anyone, but the nuances keep returning. Won't sit still. A black man disappears on a perfect afternoon into thin, high air. Now history worms into a normal, day, normal, normal day's work. They wait for the snow melt to confirm your plain bad luck. If a black man falls in a forest, the tom-tom cries and the tom-tom laughs. On a ridge, your ex-lover buries her, ear wing, her earring and, and ring her scent to keep you company. The tom-tom laughs and the tom-tom cries. At home, her, your mother boxes your things, won't eat the fruit you left behind, wonders how you were evicted. Where is the young black man? There is a blues that says gone, never coming back. Where is the young black man? There is a blues to rise the spirits, another to keep them off your door. Where is the young black man? There is a blues that says rambling can't keep still, but longs for four walls and arms that can hold you, keep you steady. Where is the young black man? There is a blues that howls the way the wind howls through the trees. Where is the young black man? There is a blues that tells us somebody doesn't have a home, following the engine's high whistle, falling to sleep beneath those pines. Since it's April, I always like reading this poem in the beginning of the beginning of the month. This is this is a way of sort of like indicating that the, uh, the that we've gotten past winter. Um, this is from Victor Soleil's Dance Craze. It's a dance poem, and 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 when I was writing Victor Soleil's Dance Craze, I had this idea that I was going to write a dance of the seasons. So there'll be so there'll be twelve um, poems for each month, and then I got to April, um, and then realized I had nine more months to go, <laughs> and stopped. But anyway. <laughs> April. Suddenly, the legs want a different sort of work. This is because the eyes look out the window and the sight is filled with hope. This is because the eyes look out the window and the street looks a fraction better than the day before. This is what the eyes tell the legs whose joints become smeared with a fresh sap which would bud if attached to a different limb. The legs want a different sort of work. 
This is because of the ears. Hear what they've been waiting for, which cannot be described in words, but makes the heart beat faster, as if one had just found money in the street. The legs want to put on a show for the entire world. The legs want to reclaim their gracefulness. This is because the nose at last finds the right scent and tugs the protesting body onto the dance floor. This is because the hands, stretching out in boredom, accidentally brush against the skirts of the world. I'm going to read a few jazz poems, and then I'm going to um, close with um, poems from Brutal Imagination. The later songs of Billie Holiday. Her voice, rough trick of will and breath, erodes out, even knowing she's beyond all trouble now. It's a worry to listen. The cabaret law, what was it? Gone like spats. Now her trumpet of a throat begins to weed. She works harder to convince these notes to stay, to treat her right. Bessie Smith. I notice an arm crooked out of an open car window in California and dream her sleeve as the car in front of us hugs a curb. Unbidden trick of light, now she briefly returns from wherever things wander, abused and waves. August breeze cooling sweat off her tuned and haunted skin. Why Was I Born? A duet between John Coltrane and Kenny Burrell. So why, asks the guitar, it's in the sax, a phonus, a genius, a lover, sidesteps the question, blows a kiss instead. Then they both begin to speak like bourbon being poured into a glass at which bar. The eternal one, bathed in the open light of the test pattern, the one where the phone booths are all functional, but so. Better here than your shitty apartment. His, her scent on the bed sheets until wash day. Perhaps longer, better here than finding lipstick on a bathroom glass. His brand of cigarette on the dresser. Their melody is the touch you now wish you'd never learned. The caress of fingers and breath that promise, promised what hurts is beautiful. The bruise of the lyric. Photo of Miles Davis at Lenny's on the Turnpike, 1968. New York grows slimmer in his absence. I suppose you could also title this picture of Miles, his lettery squint, the grace in his fingers, a sliver of the stuff you can't get anymore. As the rest of us wonder, what was the name of the driver of that truck? And the rest of us sigh. Death is one hell of a pickpocket. Photo of Dexter Gordon about the solo, 1965. To get the drift of this photo, think of the, of the relationship between the sax and the player's mouth as two halves of an exclamation point. What I mean is, tonight Dex means business ear mischief. Let's tear down the house and nobody huh, forced you to come here. Huh? Did they think of a warrior's narrow sense of duty if you want to envision his dark suit or the way a pool hustler chocks his cue to understand the way Dex's fingers adjust his mouthpiece. What I mean is, Dex the Garden's about to take that deep breath, the kind Superman took when he was too lazy to waste muscle on the bad guys. A shock of wind, a what hit us? And he could pick them up whenever he chose.
Here we go. As you can see, I'm going through. I'm actually working on a new and selected. So I go back and forth and back and forth on which ones, are, which ones are good poems and which ones are bad poems. Which ones are good poems and which ones are bad poems. So I get back and forth. <laughs> uh, sure I got the whole poem. <laughs> Lead belly. You can actually hear it in his voice. Sometimes the only way to discuss it is to grip a guitar as if it were somebody's throat and pluck. If there were a ship all through this planet, an ark where the blues could show its other face, a street where you could walk, just walk, without dogged air at your heels, at your back. Don't you think he'd choose it? Meanwhile, here's the tune. Bad luck, empty pockets, trouble walking your way with his tin ear. Okay. Chuck Berry. Hamburger wizard, long loose limb instigator, V8 engine, pouring for a storm. The evidence of a tight skirt viewed from the window of a moving city bus yelling her name, a spell into the glass. The amazing leap from nobody to stockholder. Look, Ma, no hands, pipe through a hot amp. Figure skater on the rim of the invisible class wall. The strength of the dreamer who wakes up and it's Monday, a week of work, but gets out of bed. The unsung desire of the checkout clerk, the shops of the sleepy backwater town waiting for the kid to make good, the chauffeur home. The twang of the New Jersey turnpike in the wee wee hours. The myth of the lover as he passes blameless through the walls. The fury hidden in the word, almost. The fury hidden in the word, please. The dream of one's name in lights, of sending the posse on the wrong road, shaking the wounded Indian's hand, a brother. The pulse of a crowd, knowing that the police have pushed in the door, dancing regardless. The frenzy of the word, go! The frenzy of the word, go! The frenzy of the word, go! The spark between the thought of the kiss and receiving the kiss. The, tens the tension in these words, you can't dance. The amazing duck walk, the understanding that all it's going to take is one fast song. The triumph in these words, bye bye New Jersey, as if rising from a shallow grave. The shoulder, the shoulder jerk who plots doo-wop songs. The well-intentioned business school student who does what she's told but suspects they're keeping it hid. Mr. Rock and Roll, jump over or get left behind. Mr. Taxes, who me? Money beat, money beat, you can't catch me, but they do. A perpetual well of quarters in the pocket, the incalculable hit of energy in the voice of a 16-year-old as her favorite band hits the stage, and 10,000 pair of eyes look for what they're after, more, and 10,000 voices raw for it, more, and a multitude you wouldn't care the count surrounds the joint, waits for their opportunity to break in. One more. Alabama, circular 1963, a ballot by John Coltrane. But shouldn't this state have a song? Long gliding figures of my breath of breath loss. Somebody can't sing because somebody's gone. Somebody can't sing because somebody's gone. Shouldn't this landscape, hold 
a true anthem. What you can't do, whom you can't invent, where you can't stay, why you won't keep it. But shouldn't this state have a song? And shall we call it, my face will murder me and Shall we call it, I'm not waiting. And I'm gonna close with poems from Brutal Imagination. And, and the premise of the book, people don't know the book, it's, um, it's about the imaginary guy that Susan Smith claimed murdered, um, not, um, kidnapped, carnapped her two children, when in fact she had strapped them to the backseat of the family car and rolled the car into the lake um, in um, uh, the John D. Long Lake just outside of Union, South Carolina. And for nine days, um, people were looking for this guy um, and took nine days for the, for the authorities to, to, to break her story and get her to confess what, what really happened. And the premise of the book is what would happen if that guy was alive and had been alive for those nine days and walking around and um, could talk? What was his story? What, what would be his story? How I got born. So it's common belief that Susan Smith willed me alive in the moment her babies sank into the lake. When called, I come. My job is to get things done. I am piecemeal. I make my living by taking things. So now a mother needs me clothed in hand-me-downs and a knit cap. Whatever, we arrive bereaved on a stranger's step. Baby, they weep. Poor child. My heart. Susan Smith has invented me because nobody else in town will do what she needs me to do. I mean, jump in an idling car and drive off with two sad and frightened kids in the back. Like a bad lover, she has given me a poisoned heart. It pounds both our ribs, black, angry, nothing but business. Since her fear is my blood and her need, part mythical. Everything she says about me is true. Who am I? Who are you, mister? One of the boys asks from the eternal back seat, and here is the one good thing. If I am alive, then so briefly are they. Two boys returned, three and one, quiet and scared, bunched together, breathing like small beasts. They can't place me, yet there's something familiar. Though my skin and sex are different. Maybe it's the way I drive. Or occasionally glance back with concern. Maybe it's the mixed blessing someone, perhaps circumstance, has given us. The secret thrill of hiding, childish in plain sight, seen, but not seen, as if suddenly given the power to move through walls, to know every secret without permission. We roll sleepless through the dark streets, but inside the cab is lit with brutal imagination. Once the um, photos, um, uh, uh, no, no, what should I say, the, the, um, once the drawing, the composite drawing of the, of the guy went on the AP wire, people started seeing the guy um, and the kids in the car all over the country and started calling in sightings of him. Sightings. A few nights ago, man swears he saw me pump gas with the children at a convenience store like a punchline you get the next day or a kiss in a dream that returns while you're in the middle of doing something else. I left money in his hand. 
Mr. Blank, who lives in Blank, South Carolina, of average height and a certain weight, who may or may not believe in any of the basic recognized religions, saw me move like an angel in my dusky skin and knit hat. Perhaps I looked him in the eye. Ms. Blank saw a glint of us on which highway, on the street that's close to what landmark. She now recalls the two children in the back appeared to be behaving. Mr. Blank now knows he heard the tires of the car everyone is looking for crunch the gravel as I pulled up in the wee hours at the motel where he works the night desk. I signed or didn't sign the register. I took or didn't take the key from his hand. He looked or forgot to look as I pulled off the park in front of one of the rooms at the back. Did I say I was traveling with kids? Who slept that night in the untouched beds? Where am I? Looking for Michael and Alex means that the bushes have not whispered, that the trees hold only shade, that the lake still insists on being a lake. I flicker from TV to TV. My flyer sits on their grandmother's easy chair. I hover over so many lawns, so many cups of coffee. I pour from lip to lip. The town blossoms in yellow rib ribbons, sprinkled like breadcrumbs or bait. I crackle from cell phones and shortwave. I am listened for in alleys. Looking for Michael and Alex means each car is scanned at the drive through windows, that sightings are hoped for at the self-serve pumps. Crooks long for the crook of my arm, reaching for diapers and snacks. So many days I have loped from ear to ear, from beauty parlor to church. They count the days till someone comes back. We've never left. The law. I'm a black man, which means in Susan's case that I pour out of a shadow at a traffic light, but I'm also a mother, which is why she has me promise I won't hurt your kids. Before I drift down the road, I am a mother, which is why we sing, have mercy, come home. No questions asked, but I'm black, and we both know the law. Who's going to believe that we had no choice but to open that door? Who's going to care that it was now or never, that there was no time to unbuckle them, that it was take the car or leave the car? I'm black, which means I mustn't slow down. I float in forces I can't always control, but I'm also a mother, which is why I hope I'm as good as my word. Composite. I am not the hero of this piece. I am only a stray thought, a solution. But now my face is stuck to lampposts, glued to, to plate glass. My forehead is stapled to my hat. I am here and here I am not. I am a door that opens and out walks. No one can help you. Now I gaze straight into your eyes from bulletin boards, tree trunks. I am papered everywhere, a blizzard called. You see what happens? I turn up when least expected. If you decide to buy some milk, if you decide to wash your car, if you decide to mail a letter, I might tumbleweed upon a pet leg. You can stare and stare, but I can't be found. Susan has loosed me on the neighbors, a cold representative, the scariest face you could think of. Then there comes a, a section where other fictional black characters comment on the story um, that's happened so far. I'm not going to read all the poems of that section. I'm just going to read one. Uh, Uncle Tom and Heaven. My name is Mud. Let's get that out of the way. First, I am not a child. I was made to believe that God kept notes, ran a tab on the blows, so many on one cheek, so many on the other. I watched another black man pour from a white woman's head. I fear he'll live the way I did, a brute, a flimsy ghost of an idea. Both of us groomed to go only so far. That was my duty. I'm well aware of what I have become, a name children use to separate themselves on a playground. Doesn't matter to know I'm someone else's lie. Doesn't help anything to tell you I was built to be a hammer, a war cry. Like him, nobody knew me, but in my prime, I 
filled the streets, worried into the eardrum, scared up thoughts of laws and guns. How I would love not to be dubious, but I am a question whole races spend their time trying to answer. My author believed in God. And being denied the power to hate her, I watch another black man roam the land, dull in his invented hide. Then we're back to the guy. What I'm made of. Susan fills our hands with plain objects. Key, door handle, steering wheel. But my hands are nothing. A song you can't remember the words to. The button that pops off a vest. A comb that falls out of a pocket or purse. Susan fills my lungs with air. But what do I breathe out? Parchment, ink, low growls. The blank gap between words. Nothing fits upon my back. Nothing actually catches my eye. I am hidden and found. I am north, south, east, west. My dark skin porous in between. Susan claims my name is muscle, bone, calls me tissue and sinew, fills in my blank with the absence of her boys. But I am water, pebble, silt and gravity, evidence under her nail. Sympathy. The sheriff's too good to be true. He tries to urge Susan and me to part. He trusts a friendly cup of coffee will skim me loose, but we're hard to untangle. I won't be easy. We know his help is poison. He is courting us. We run a cold sweat while he waits. He is too good to be true. I am not for his ears, Susan knows. She tries not to weep. He attempts to lean towards us. We bob together in the god-awful silence. Two more. Confession. There have been days I've almost spilled from her, nearly taken a breath, yanked myself clean. I've trembled her coffee cup. I well under her eyelids. I've been gravel on her mattress. I am not Gone, I am going to worm my way out. I have not disappeared. I have slide between her teeth, double her over as she tries not to blurt me out. The closer Susan inches me towards this, the louder the sheriff hears me, bitch. And this is the last poem. It's a, it's a duet. First thing you're gonna hear is lines that were lifted from Susan Smith's actual handwritten confession. And the response is the imaginary guy. Birthing. When I left my home on October 25th, I was very emotionally distraught. I have yet to breathe. I am in the back of her mind. Not even a notion, a scrabble cloth, the way a man lopes down the street. Later a black woman will say, we knew exactly who she was describing. At this point, I have no language, no tongue, no mouth. I am not me yet. I am just an understanding. As I rode and rode and rode, I felt even more anxiety. Susan parks on a bridge and stares over the rail. Below her feet, a dark blanket of river. She wants to pull over herself, children and all. I am not the call of the current. She is heartbroken. She gazes down and imagines heaven. I felt I couldn't be a good mom anymore, but I didn't want my children to grow up without a mom. I am not me yet. At the bridge, one of Susan's kids cries, so she drives to the lake, to the boat dock. I am not yet opportunity. I had never felt so lonely and so sad. Who shall be a witness? Bullfrogs, waterfowl. When I was at John D. Long Lake, I had never felt so scared and unsure. 
I have yet to be called. Who will notice? Moths, dragonflies, field mice. I wanted to end my life so bad. And I was in my car, ready to go down that ramp into the water. My hand isn't her hand, panicked on the emergency brake. And I did go part way, but I stopped. I am not gravity, the water lapping against the gravel. I went again and stopped. I then got out of the car. Susan stares at the sinking. My muscles aren't her muscles, burned from pushing. The lake has no appetite, but it takes the car slowly, swallow by swallow, like a snake. Why was I feeling this way? Why was everything so bad in my life? Susan stares at the taillights as they slide from here to hidden. I have no answers to these questions. She only has me after she removes our hands from our ears. Thank you.